If you've seen my second video in this series uh, of Esoteric Saturday Talks, uh, you'll know that something very strange happened to me 19 years ago. Uh, a, a prayer was answered in a very um, uh, freakishly precise way, and I've been trying to work out exactly what happened um, uh, on that fateful day uh, ever since. This is one of the things that I've learnt about uh, since that day, and and although I don't think it was intended to uh, to answer this particular question, I think it can shed some light. So it's called the double slit experiment. Some of you may know it already. Uh, some of you may just not know how it can be applied to answered prayers. Bear with me. I'll I'll first of all explain how it works. And then I'll talk about uh, how uh, it may be related. If you already know how it works, check down below. I'll, I'll put some, some, uh, some uh, time signatures for when you can skip <laughs> to if you already know how the double slit experiment works. So uh, very briefly, um, the double slit experiment works with uh, a piece of cardboard with two slits in it, quite simply. Okay, and uh, it's put it under two different conditions. First of all, against a wall, we put the cardboard with the two slits. So this is a, a section view from the top uh, with the two slits uh, right there. Now, in the case of particles, um, what we have is, let's say, a paintball cannon. All right. Now this paintball cannon is very imprecise. It's shooting all over the place um, and mostly it's hitting the cardboard and some of the paintballs are going to get lucky and they're going to go just in the right direction to hit the wall over here in the background. And some of them will be just lucky enough to go through this slit and they'll hit the wall over here. So basically, when you have particles, particles means individual things, okay? Um, in this case, paint balls. When you have particles, individual items that are being shot one at a time, you would expect the wall after the experiment to look like this. Okay. Two points at which the particles are hitting the wall. Okay, so that's called the particle pattern over here, waves. If we have waves instead of particles, okay, so we put the whole thing into water, and now this time, instead of just having a, a bare wall, we cover this wall with a material that's going to change color with pressure, okay? So what's going to happen now is that wherever there is a lot of pressure against the wall, the wall is going to change color and where there is less pressure it'll stay the same color. All right. Now if we drop a stone into the water over here it's going to cause ripples uh, to appear in the water. Now you can uh, imagine already that here right in the middle is where it's going to cause the most amount of pressure and as you radiate out over here, it, the pressure would be rather in this direction. Uh, and so where it's hitting here is much, much less uh, uh, intense. All right, but we're not really interested in how it's hitting the piece of cardboard. We're interested in what's happening once it's hit the piece of cardboard. Well, all of this pressure is being stopped. So all that's left is the pressure that is able to get out of these holes. So you will in effect get new ripples exiting from the two um, from the two holes. Okay, so that's one side. And then on the other side you'll get these ripples appearing as well. So you'll get two patterns like this. Now what you'll notice already is that 
these ripples overlap. Okay, and they cause they cause <laughs> they cause a, a, an interference. So what's going to happen is that let me change colors so it's clear what I'm doing. What's going to happen is that in these places where the waves of the ripple join, that's going to cause more pressure than what's just next to it. It's also going to cause more pressure than where there's only one wave. So two waves combined is going to create much more pressure, okay, all the way to the end over here. So here you'll get a spot and then over here you'll get a spot as well. Over here, ah, I didn't do that very straight. Of course, ripples would be much more, um, much more regular than <laughs> than my drawing. Uh, and then again, over here, you would get another spot. And then you, so you'd get spots all the way down. Okay. So this is effectively what the pattern would be like when there's a wave, okay? So a, a wave being pushed through two slits makes this pattern. Particles being pushed through two slits gives this pattern. Now, what happened in 1801 for the first time, actually, um, this experiment was made with photons, and then much later in 1927, uh, the experiment was repeated using um, using electrons to know whether electrons behaved as waves or as particles. So they shot a load of, of electrons and what they found was that the pattern that was made was a wave pattern. So they thought to themselves, okay, Clearly, we're shooting too many electrons at the same time. Uh, we need to just shoot one at a time. So they significantly reduced the rate at which these electrons were being shot so that they were sure that only one atom was being shot at any one given time. What they found was that the electrons being shot one at a time were still creating a wave pattern. Which was very, very surprising <laughs> to the people conducting the experiment. So what they did is that they set up a sensor. Let's represent that like an eye. A sensor that would observe which of the slits an individual um, electron was going through. And at that point, the pattern that was created was no longer the wave pattern, but started to become the particle pattern. When the electrons were being observed, they were behaving like particles. And when they weren't being observed, they were behaving like waves. Very, very strange situation. So the people involved in, uh, in the experiment, who are much cleverer than I am, worked out, in fact, that on the quantum scale, so much, much smaller even than the microscopic scale, um, things behave strangely. When they're not being observed, they can be in more than one place at the same exact time. In fact, they can exist and not exist at the same exact time. What they determined is that um, these electrons were going in, well, they were going in random places and they uh, were hitting the piece of cardboard. They were going through uh, this 
slot, they were going through that slot, they were going through both slots, they were going through neither slot, all at the same time because they existed in many places at once, which is crazy for, <laughs> for anyone who believes in a, in a realist point of view for realism versus idealism. See video number three in this series, uh, which is why I made that video before this one. Uh, but, uh, uh, but yes, so, so the, the conclusion was if we're observing reality, then it is only at one place at a time. Okay, so when it's observed, the electron is only at one place at a time. But when you stop observing it, it's everywhere, nowhere, in many places, at the exact same moment. Okay, so the conclusion is that reality on the quantum level gets picked, rather the, yeah, gets, gets chosen at the point of observation. So just by observing where the electron is, you cancel out every other option. It's called collapsing the eigenstate. <laughs> I, I, can't, I can't begin to tell you why it's called collapsing the eigenstate, but what it does is that it collapses all the options that weren't observed. This wasn't observed, this wasn't observed, only the black trajectory was observed, right? So if this was observed, then everything else was not observed and therefore not part of reality, okay? So by observing reality, we collapse everything that's not the particular reality that we observed, right? That is, uh, uh, true on the quantum level, but I'm suggesting that it might have something to tell us about how the the macro level works as well. You see, um, if you consider time versus certainty, right, um, we can be absolutely certain of anything that's going on right now. The majority of what's going on right now. Okay. Now that certainty dips quite steeply as we go into the past. Now I know that my dinner consisted of uh, a, a, a lentil soup. Okay. That's what I had for dinner. I know that for sure. What did I have for dinner this time last week? I'd have to think very, very carefully. I've got no records anywhere of what I had for dinner uh, last Friday. I can only really rely on my memory. So suddenly the certainty goes down here somewhere. But what did I have for dinner on the 3rd of January um, 1983, I am absolutely certain that nobody knows, right? Uh, absolutely certain that nobody knows. Maybe some regression hypnotherapy could bring it up, I, I, but how can we trust that, right? So the, the certainty of anything dr dips significantly as you go towards the past. The same is true for the future. Now, you, you might think, yeah, but the, the future is all, always completely uncertain. Well, not really. I'm right here making this video. I know that in five minutes, I'm not going to be uh, on a beach uh, <laughs> uh, getting a suntan uh, somewhere very nice. Uh, I know that in five minutes time, I may still be making this video, but if I've already finished, then I, I might be on my way to uh, my computer where I'm going to start editing it. I, 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 don't, I don't know exactly where I'm going to be, but I do know that the majority of options can be dismissed, right? 
But where am I going to be at this time next Friday? I haven't made any plans. Uh, I, you know, I, I've made a, a commitment to release videos like this every Saturday. So, you know, it's quite likely that I'm going to be making another one of these videos. But who knows? You know, anything can happen. And then at this time next year, I might have said everything that I wanted to say, at which point, you know, I, I, I might be doing something completely different. I, I have no idea what I'm going to be doing at this time next year, let alone in 10 years time. OK, so what I see is that this is certainty. So what's left is chaos. It's potential. It's those eigenstates that could happen. All right. If it's possible, then it's in here. If it's impossible, then it's just not in here. OK, but if it's possible, then then it belongs in this part. And the more you go into the future, the more chaos there is. The more you go into the past, the more chaos there is. And something that you've observed or something that has been observed collapses that chaos. Now that time, that now moment moves into the future. Let's assume we've got a linear uh, timeline, OK? Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll go with that for, for this video. We can talk about the nature of time in another video. Uh, but for now, let's let's go with the with the story that the the now moment moves towards in the future. Well, that certainty also moves into the future. So the more certain we are, the the less of this chaos remains. So let's say this is uh, f f the same Friday next year. I could be doing this. I might be doing that. 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 Might be doing that. As the now moment arrives into the future, more and more of these are going to get um, uh, cancelled out. Right as the as the uh, as we get more and more certainty and less and less chaos. So this time next year, let's say that I'm still living where I'm currently living. I'm still putting out these videos. Then suddenly the visit to Scotland, which I haven't planned yet, is definitely out of the picture. The um, uh, the the me will it, winning the lottery uh, is not is out of the picture as well because I still haven't bought a ticket at this point. Okay, so the the more we get to any given point, the more of these possibilities get eradicated. Right now, we have learnt from here that observation is something that destroys possibilities. Observation is something that collapses eigenstates. These are all the eigenstates of the future, right? They are all possibilities. They are all options until they get observed. Once this one, once this option is the one that got observed, that's the one that gets fixed, right? And then as the now as the now moment moves away from it, yes, it's part of my memory. But then once I'm dead, if there are no recordings, if there are no records for someone else to then reobserve, who knows, maybe all of these reappear again, maybe all those possibilities reappear again just in the past. Now, I believe that Prayer, rituals, all of the techniques suggested by the uh, law of attraction uh, uh, movement, um, all of all of these psychological <laughs> techniques, which are designed to bring about a desired outcome through the power of mind, 
I think that they work when used in conjunction with visualization. Okay, what do I mean by that? I think that if I can visualize my favorite outcome here, right, I can make sure that this eigenstate has a better chance of survival than any others. I can't force this eigenstate to survive, right? But I can give it a better chance of survival than any of the others. It's speculation. Please don't go imagining that I know the answer here. I am just observing what um, what the world has to offer in terms of, of knowledge and thinking to myself, does does this help to understand why prayers are sometimes answered? Now there was a there was an experiment um, performed in a in a hospital where uh, people recovering from heart surgery were being prayed for, and half of the people were being prayed for, and then a control half were not being prayed for, and nobody knew whether they were being prayed for or not. The ones who were being prayed for fared worse than the ones who weren't being prayed for. Now, that has been used to prove that prayer doesn't work. But I say, no, if you don't give people specific uh, instructions on how to pray, i.e. to visualize the desired outcome, then what people are naturally going to do, especially if they're praying for people that they don't know, is that they're going to th think, okay, um, patient number three has got a, a, a bad situation with their heart. They're in hospital. They're, they're suffering. They're, and, and please, please help them to stop suffering because they, they're probably in a lot of pain. And, and so you, you, naturally, somebody praying is going to visualize the bad stuff and say, please, not that. <laughs> but while they're visualizing the, the bad stuff, that is in fact the eigenstate that they're reinforcing. So, so that's what I have to say. I, I, I don't know if it's uh, of any use to you. I, I hope you are at least intrigued. Um, let me know, know down below if it was, uh, if it's at least um, <laughs> piqued your interest. And, uh, and uh, yeah, and I'll see you next Saturday. I'll definitely see you before next Saturday with, with some more reviews. But uh, to talk some more about, uh, about this kind of stuff, It'll be next Saturday and I'll look forward to, uh, to seeing you there. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to give us a thumbs up. Subscribe if you haven't already and see you very soon. Bye.